Since the dawn of human history, humanity has desired to explore what laid beyond the far horizon. But wonder is often shackled by fear. For Christopher Columbus, faith and conviction inspired a voyage that will forever change our world. Columbus's great voyage in 1492 is the dawning of a new age. The modern era is being ushered in by a daring visionary and giant of the Renaissance. Generations of Americans have looked to Columbus as one of the great heroes of history and as symbolizing the American spirit. I think we have to recognize that that spirit of entrepreneurship and daring and imagination and persistence, Columbus is the guy who gives us a sense that there is one world that we all live in. Columbus was a courageous person. His courage enabled the exchanges of culture that have shaped the world ever since. Christopher Columbus was actually the first founding father of our country. You can no more ignore his contributions to our country than you can those of Washington, Jefferson, and Lincoln. There are strong Marxist and anarchist elements that want to take down Columbus, not really because they care about Native Americans, but because they care about tearing down symbols of Western civilization. Columbus was a fearless navigator, perhaps the best who ever lived. First and foremost, he was the discoverer of America. Certainly, mistakes were made under his watch as governor. But now a radical, one-sided narrative says that Columbus represents all that is evil in the American experience. Simply put, that is false history. Judging Columbus from the perspective of ideology distorts both his motivations and his accomplishments. July 4th at about 8 p.m., the mob turned to the statue. They brought it down, it fell, it broke in several pieces. They drug it over to where the harbor was and they dumped it in the harbor. I'm a first generation American. My Italian heritage means everything to me. Columbus Day was part of that heritage. And when the statue came down, I was devastated. I was angry. That's our heritage in the harbor. We hired a diver, a crane, a tractor trailer to haul the remains. So we're in the process of trying to restore the statue back to its original look because that Columbus statue is a symbol that we can look up to and make us proud of not only being Italians, but being Americans in this country. Before it became the subject of protest and controversy, Christopher Columbus and his epic voyage in 1492 was seen as the first chapter in the birth of the United States. The term Columbia becomes the national personification of the 13 colonies. Hail Columbia is composed for George Washington's inauguration and remains the unofficial national anthem for more than a century. And for Catholic immigrants facing bigotry and persecution in 19th century America, Christopher Columbus stands as a beacon of hope that Catholics could be both good citizens and faithful Catholics. In the Southern United States, Italian immigrants pour in following the aftermath of the Civil War. They rapidly replace the labor of freed slaves on plantations. In New Orleans, many settle in the French Quarter, which becomes known as Little Sicily. Over 80% of the Italian immigrants came from Southern Italy. Uh, they were dark complected, and as a result, they were treated as people of color when they arrived in America. They were treated as not even citizens. They were called subhumans because of the, the color of their skin. On October 15, 1890, New Orleans Police Commissioner David Hennessy is shot and killed on a darkened street. There is no positive identification of the shooters, but public anger quickly turns against the Italian community. Local newspapers freely blame Dagos for the murder. Hundreds of Italians are rounded up and 19 men are ultimately charged with the murder. 
but a jury of their peers finds them not guilty. The fever pitch newspapers published stories again and again of these dark immigrants, uh, these criminals, these low persons to America. And eventually a mob came to the jail. Five to 10,000 people, they came that next morning, they broke into the prison, they shot nine of them, and the other two were hanged, one on a tree and one on a lamppost outside the prison. President Benjamin Harrison was one of the few public officials who was appalled by the lynchings. In an effort to help promote peace and understanding throughout the country, and called for a national observance of Columbus Day. In the wake of the lynching in New Orleans, for so many Italian Americans, the idea of our belonging here is in question. And Columbus was a wonderful spearhead for our people in establishing the idea that we've been with you from the very beginning. That's how Columbus Day started. It started on the backs of the largest lynching in America. President Harrison is not just seeking to appease the Italian community in calling for a celebration of Columbus Day. It is also to be a national holiday for Native Americans. The 1890 massacre at Wounded Knee, where U.S. soldiers brutally killed nearly 200 Sioux men, women, and children, is still a fresh wound on the national psyche. President Harrison's proclamation of the holiday says that this is a time to celebrate the making of a new class of American citizens, the new immigrants and the Native Americans. And so it was meant as a unifying holiday. In Syracuse, New York, the idea for a Columbus statue begins in 1909 when in the face of great discrimination, a group of Italian immigrants begins plans to honor their favorite native son. But in 2020, large groups of protesters demand that Syracuse remove the statue. I saw these signs, the words genocide, evil, hate, and I said, I gotta take those down. I rolled my shorts up, waded through the water, and climbed the obelisk. I reached up and I took them down. And the joy of that moment overwhelmed me. And as I'm climbing down the statue, the security guards came up to me and said, what are you doing, sir? And I said, I'm here to protect the thousands of dollars that poor Italian Americans gave to put this statue up. They were there for me, I'm here for them. How did Christopher Columbus go from an American hero to a brutal conqueror and genocidal maniac? The first thing to realize is that these attacks are nothing new. In fact, it is white supremacists who historically spearheaded attacks on Columbus. In the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan organized to stop Columbus Day celebrations and oppose Columbus statues. Cross burnings was one of its tactics. The Klan was anti-immigrant anti-Hispanic, anti-Italian, and anti-Catholic. Its war on Columbus became a way to advance its white supremacist narrative against immigrants, people of color, and Catholics. The attacks on Columbus's legacy gained new steam in 1980 when historian Howard Zinn publishes A People's History of the United States. The book sells more than two million copies and spawns a cottage industry. The evidence for Howard Zinn being a communist comes from himself and from his FBI file, which is almost 500 pages long. What Howard Zinn was trying to accomplish was to inspire students and readers to overthrow this country. Zinn really portrays almost every famous leader of America in a rather cartoonish fashion. They're all villains, and Christopher Columbus is no exception. He repeatedly plagiarized. The man who wrote the book that Howard Zinn plagiarized from was a socialist and a playwright. He was not a historian. Howard Zinn took passages from Columbus's diary, but 
he left to out, where he talks with affection about these native people, where he wants to bring them to the faith. He's doing this out of love. Those are all eliminated. And so you get these distorted passages taken out of context. Zinn's portrayal of Columbus as a ruthless conqueror guilty of genocide has helped transform how multiple generations of American students view their country and the legacy of Christopher Columbus. Why don't we hear more positive things about Columbus? Well, because Columbus is now a political issue rather than a historical issue. So I think that his defense is best made by the truth of his history. This day, it's when Columbus discovered the United States from Italy back in 1492. And we're all proud to be Italian and American. The search for the real Columbus begins in 15th century Genoa, a republic now part of Italy. Columbus is born here in 1451 to a family of limited means. Genoa is a key merchant port filled with daring sailors and adventurers. Columbus first takes to the sea as a teenager. He sailed all the Mediterranean to Greece. He went all the way down the African coast. He probably made trips uh, north as well to England, Ireland. So he was an experienced sailor. Self-educated in astronomy, cartography, and navigation, Columbus settles in Lisbon, Portugal, and becomes consumed with a singular vision, a plan to find a faster and safer route to Asia by sailing west across the Atlantic. The fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453 has a seismic effect on Columbus's world. Europeans had relied on Constantinople as the commercial link between Europe and Asia. Turkish military expansion into Eastern Europe and now the Mediterranean Sea threatened all of that. So Christopher Columbus is inspired to find a trade route to China, not by going east, but by sailing west. Columbus spent a long time in Lisbon, so it was logical that he would present his idea to the Portuguese king, which he did, but the king turned him down. So Columbus decided to go to Spain, and he spent something like seven years trying to persuade Fernando and Isabel to back his voyage. In 1492, Spain has successfully completed its Reconquista and ended nearly 800 years of Moorish rule. This opens the door for Ferdinand and Isabella to finally approve Columbus's bold plan. He thought he was setting up a trading post by going to the Indies. But partly what he was also after was evangelizing, of preaching the gospel to all nations, as Jesus says in, in Matthew. On October 12th, after more than two months at sea, Columbus makes landfall in the present-day Bahamas on a site he named San Salvador. For nearly five months, Columbus interacts with the native peoples and explores the Caribbean islands. During Columbus's first voyage, he treated the natives that he encountered with kindness, and the natives reciprocated. There was no violence on either side. I have a quotation. This is his view about the natives. He said, I believe that in the world there are no better people or a better land. They love their neighbors as themselves. They have the sweetest speech in the world. They are gentle and always laughing. After the Santa Maria shipwrecks on Christmas Eve, 1492, friendly natives help rescue the Spaniards. Columbus develops a deep and enduring friendship with the local chief, Wakanagari. They exchange valuable gifts, and when Columbus returns to Spain, he leaves behind 39 men with clear instructions to treat the natives with kindness and gratitude. He took six natives back with him and he said, and he wrote in his diary, more wanted to go, but he didn't have room. And so they get back to Spain. All six of them were baptized. Baptized people could not be enslaved. Two of them decided to remain at court. One of them became Columbus's godson and traveled with him on his other voyages. And when Fernando and Isabel greeted him in Barcelona, they agreed 
to finance the second voyage. And the second voyage was a larger operation. It was designed for settlement. Columbus set sail for his second voyage on September 24th, 1493, with 17 ships and about 1,200 men. When he lands in Hispaniola, he discovers that all the men he left behind have been killed, not by Chief Guacanagari, his ally and friend, but by a rival chieftain. When they arrive back at Hispaniola, they discover a gruesome sight. All of the men that he'd left behind were dead and on the beach or floating in the water. So the men that Isabella had sent over, they wanted to go and kill Guacanagari and his people. And Columbus said, absolutely not. And so he went and talked to Guacanagari and learned that they had gone against his orders, had gone to this other group, raping and murdering. And that group came and killed them all. And he believed Guacanagari. Columbus and his men also faced difficulties with the enemies of the Tainos, the violent Caribs whose cruelty towards the Spaniards and other tribes made peaceful relations increasingly difficult. On the first voyage, he met with the Tainos, the people that I came from. And everywhere that he went, everybody would run away, and he did not know why it happened. The Tainos were the victims of the Caribs. That's where the word Caribbean comes from. It also where the word cannibal comes from. They cannibalized entire islands. They killed people, they raped the women, they were raiders. Look, the warfare that existed in the Caribbean existed prior to Columbus. There was torture, there was cannibalism, there was genocide. The Caribs, who were cannibals, were at war with the Tainos, the more peaceful people that he first encountered. And he gets drawn into this conflict. And so he does things that, you know, repressing certain tribes that are warring with one another, but because he doesn't know what else to do. Columbus sends a letter to Ferdinand and Isabella proposing to enslave some of the Carib peoples who were causing such harm to his men and to the friendly Tainos. Because the Caribs are captured during war and guilty of cannibalism, they are eligible for enslavement under the laws of Columbus's time. Slavery at that time was practiced the world over, particularly in Asia, the Middle East, Africa, and it was practiced by many of the native people in the Western Hemisphere. So Columbus didn't bring slavery to America. This is the one thing that I think most revisionist historians don't recognize, that slavery is a universal institution until the modern world. Slavery existed in those Indian tribes here in North America, as well as in Central America and South America. Columbus's chief aim remains evangelization. He wants to share the gospel of Christ with the native people, not only for the salvation of their souls, but also because a baptized person could not be enslaved. He really wanted to have everyone be baptized. That's why he kept asking for priests. He was a believer, a very strong believer, and nobody knows this. He became a Franciscan when he returned to Spain after that horrible stuff. And it is said that he wore the robes for the rest of his life. Most of the settlers who joined Columbus on his third voyage are greedy men bent on making quick profits. But the creation of a permanent settlement on the island of Hispaniola quickly reveals that Columbus's talents as a navigator and sailor far exceed his skill at governing. He actually got himself into a lot of trouble because he would be indulgent both toward the Spaniards and toward the indigenous peoples. And then after he was indulgent, things would get out of hand and then he would have to come in and rather forcefully set things in order again. And this created all kinds of problems. My reading of him is he basically was happiest when he was sailing. He was a great navigator. He wasn't anywhere near as good as a governor. Columbus refuses to allow Spanish settlers to take advantage of the natives and insists that everyone share in the labor, regardless of their social position. But the settlers resent Columbus as a Genoese foreigner and resist and exploit the natives at every opportunity. At the same time, Ferdinand and Isabella send Judge Francisco de Bobadilla to investigate complaints leveled against Columbus by discontent settlers. Columbus executes by hanging seven of the Spanish rebels. When the new governor got there, he could see the, the men hanging from the trees. He knew something was wrong even before he got to shore. 
He essentially decided that the Columbus faction was improperly governing. So he arrested Columbus and his brother and sent them back in chains. After his acquittal of all wrongdoing, Columbus would make one more voyage to the New World in 1502, his fourth and last, dying four years later on May 20th, 1506. In the years to follow, Columbus's successes on Hispaniola will carry out great abuses against the natives. Many of these crimes have been erroneously charged to Columbus. In one example, many revisionist historians accuse Columbus of cutting off the hands of natives who are unable to pay the mandatory gold tribute. In reality, this punishment is meted out by Columbus's successor, but abuses carried out by the Spanish colonists become greatly exaggerated as rival colonial powers begin to promote propaganda known as the Black Legend. The Black Legend is a kind of a myth that French and, and British and Dutch uh, explorers set up that the Spaniards were uniquely evil in the way that they repressed Indians. And the irony is that within 10 years of Columbus's first arrival in the New World, Spain absolutely forbade slavery. In recent years, a modern black legend has emerged, claiming that Columbus and the Spanish that came after him perpetrated genocide against the native people of the New World. European diseases such as smallpox came and it wiped out millions of people. Very tragic event, incredibly tragic event. Um, was that Columbus's intent? Did Columbus sell the ocean blue to bring smallpox to the New World? He didn't, he was an explorer. We should have an honest review of the work and legacy of Christopher Columbus. And we should have something more. Every community, state, and province should undertake a review of its own treatment of the native peoples, both past and present. That review will find no trace of Columbus. He was not there when the Puritans of Connecticut destroyed the Pequot nation, nor was he along the Trail of Tears, walked by the Cherokee, or at the massacres of Sand Creek or Wounded Knee. None of this was the influence of Christopher Columbus. He never even set foot on the mainland of North America. Native people have a right to an honest recounting of their history. Scapegoating one man for what has happened over centuries does not bring us closer to understanding, reconciliation, or even justice. In fact, it does just the opposite. If we're gonna blame Columbus for everything that went wrong, we maybe ought to also give him some credit for the many, many good things that have happened, the great explosion of prosperity, the very unification of the world that has happened since the 15th century. What happened when Columbus came to the New World is what some people call the Columbian Exchange, that foodstuffs began to change, that chilies and hot peppers went to the New World, and peanuts and tomatoes and corn and potatoes and coffee. So there's an amazing new mixture of the globalized world that Columbus began. Of native communities that are elevated to new levels of prosperity by things like introducing sugar production, silk weaving, ranching, breeding pigs. I mean, none of these things existed in this hemisphere until the Spaniards introduced them. At Columbus Circle, where the Christopher Columbus statue stands strong and stands tall, at the bottom of the statue, there are these incredible words that say, to the world, he gave a world. And that doesn't mean only to Italian Americans. He gave it to everyone and all people. And we feel that Columbus statue should stand and Columbus Day should be celebrated. There is no reason for others to take away that holiday from us. Al Cristoforo Colombo, che dicono che era dei vostri. Ma il si sa, ha fatto una sfida grande, ha avuto il coraggio. While meeting with young people in Genoa, Italy, Pope Francis encouraged them to have the virtue of a navigator, to face great challenges, and to show courage when they do. Then he pointed to the example of Christopher Columbus. 
In this same way, Columbus has been a model for generations of Americans, not because of the way he administered a territory, but because he had the courage to change the world. Columbus did not discover a perfect world, nor did he build one, but he opened up the possibility for those who came after him to create a better one. That is the promise and the responsibility of America, a nation that we must not allow to be defined by the mistakes of its past, but instead be defined by its continued progress in the pursuit of freedom and justice for all. Columbus's bold journey planted the seeds of the great American experiment. It opened the doors to more than 500 years of immigration, allowing hundreds of millions to discover the American dream. Each immigrant story is one of courage and determination, but new immigrants have always recognized that Columbus went first. Not knowing what lay beyond the horizon, he willingly embraced the risk that no contemporary would, to ride the sea with the prevailing wind and with no sure path home. His daring spirit and his Christian faith changed the course of history and made America what it is today. That is why we celebrate Columbus Day. And that is why statues in his honor will continue to stand tall.